Hi, my name is Antoinette Namarve, and I'd like to present my doctoral um, thesis as I presented it during my doctoral defense. Um, I did it at the ETH in Zurich uh, with the Center of Development Economics and the ICP. And so my PhD is all about responsible gold supply chains from Burkina Faso, Switzerland. And in my thesis, I look at um, the entire gold supply chain, um, but today we will be focusing at the very beginning and the end where my main studies are located then. And I'll specifically be looking at extraction from Burkina Faso, one of the largest producers of gold in Africa, all the way to Switzerland, one of the largest consumers of gold uh, in the world. And so these two countries are not only on the opposite sides of the gold supply chain, but if we think of a spectrum of development, they might even be on extreme ends. With Burkina Faso ranking one of the lowest scores of all countries considered for the Human Development Index, and Switzerland scoring one of the highest. Um, also, various uh, a substantial portion of Burkina Faso's population lived below various poverty lines, while basically no one in Switzerland lives below these lines. But despite this um, very different context, these very different worlds, these two countries share a very special bond in terms of the trade in gold. Um, uh, with almost all of Burkina Faso's gold being exported to Switzerland for refinement. And so the vast majority of this gold is extracted by what we call industrial mining, which is what we typically think of uh, when we think of a mining operation. It's an industrial, uh, industrial formalized mining operation, usually conducted by a company. Uh, they have official licenses issued by the government. Um, but my study looks at a very different types of mining operation called artisanal mining. And artisanal mining has been, is, is, there's million of, millions of artisanal miners worldwide in, in uh, about more than 70 countries. And it's also been increasing quite significantly in the last few decades. Um, and artisanal mining is basically just an informal mining operation. Um, uh, it's people, groups of people looking for gold. Um, in this case, it could also be other um, metals or even gemstones um, with very little capital and very labor intensive. And although some of them do have like permission from the governments to mine, the vast majority of artisanal miners are informal or illegal. So while industrial mines can encourage economic growth, um, and drag foreign direct investment, artist, they don't directly employ that many people. Where with artisanal mining, they create a livelihood directly for quite a lot of millions of people. But despite this um, large potential to alleviate poverty, the sector is known for a wide range of human rights abuses like child labor and also um, environmental degradation, or specifically also mercury pollution. So in, in Switzerland, many civil societies and other organizations have kind of rightly pointed out, um, and these and many other reports, the impact that the gold consumed and refined in Switzerland have on these countries with some of the poorest countries in the world. So in my PhD, I also looked at various issues throughout the gold supply chain um, and ways we can alleviate these problems while still maintaining the sector's benefits. And so my PhD was part of an initiative at the ETH to try and encourage interdisciplinary research. I was part of a group uh, called the Swiss Minerals Observatory um, at the ISP. And we were basically a few PhDs from different fields, all looking into responsible metal supply chains. And so while my PhD is very firmly rooted in development economics, um, I was also in the chair of development economics and cooperation. Um, I received very valuable inputs for my PhD from fellow PhDs, um, from fellow PhDs working with me. Um, and you also refer, hear me refer to these inputs throughout the presentation. All right, so now I want to go into a bit more depth into the actual studies of my PhD and we start in the country of extraction. Um, so the first study looks at the, the potential of artisanal mining to alleviate poverty. Um, and the reason why it has such a high potential is because gold is so valuable. 
So, for example, if you look at the world gold price, it just increased significantly in the last um, few decades. Uh, and researchers often assume that local gold prices follow this same trend. Um, but we got the opportunity to challenge this assumption because during COVID, we, we surveyed about uh, 300 miners in Burkina Faso, more than half of whom were involved in the gold trade. And we asked them a bunch of things, including their experiences with trading gold, market conditions, and the prices they received. And we surveyed them three times. First was shortly before COVID hit, then early during COVID when there was many travel restrictions, and then again later when most of these travel restrictions were lifted. And so what we found was indeed these two prices did not follow the same trend. Um, in a time when the world gold price increased quite significantly, local prices uh, plummeted. And so we believe this is due to the different market conditions. While the global market is really competitive um, and very resilient against shocks, local markets are much more vulnerable. Um, and some of these market imperfections include most notably the fact that there aren't that many traders or gold collectors that can buy gold from miners. So miners don't have that many opportunities to sell their gold. We did find that actually this improved quite a bit. The gold price, local gold prices improved uh, when travel restrictions were lifted. But it's not like these local miners can wait for prices to recover um, because they're, first of all, very dependent on the income from mining. And it's also just not safe for them to keep it on their person. So we basically find that um, artisanal miners who's often, who are often very poor individuals were forced to sell gold at very low prices at a time when the world gold price was doing quite well. And so these findings are quite relevant, first of all, for policymakers. Um, they could uh, make local markets more competitive. This would protect miners' livelihoods, uh, for example, they could broadcast the world gold prices on radio or give miners access to credit or even act as a buyer themselves. Um, but also for researchers, these findings are quite important because we need to be careful when we use the world gold price as a proxy for, for local prices. And this brings me to my second study, um, where two researchers called um, Basilia and Gerard wanted to find out what was the impact of um, uh, artisanal mines on the communities living around them, specifically what was the impact on the household's consumption. Um, and so ideally when you, when you want to determine something's impact, you want to compare community before and after, in this case a mine open, to a similar community over the same period that didn't have a mine. So you want some variation over time and space. And the Zilin Girard, they did have variation over time because Oh, sorry, over space um, and geogra geographical variation because they didn't know where some mining licenses in the country were. Um, now, mine license, licensed mines are only the minority of artisanal mines, but still they did have some information. And um, what they did not have was uh, any temporal variation because they didn't know when these mines opened. So what they did instead is they assumed that the mine had always been operational, and then instead they looked at changes in the world gold price to see what's the impact on these communities. Um, but with because of our first study that we found um, that um, uh, there's a disconnect between the world gold price and local prices, we believe a more refined analysis is necessary. And so we contribute to their study in, in a few ways. Um, First, we wanted to understand the impact on the wider range of indicators, including assets, school enrollment, and infant mortality. Um, and for this, we used two large databases. Uh, one is from the World Bank, the LSMS. The other one is from USAID, uh, the DHS survey. Um, so these surveys were done on about almost 100,000 households um, over eight different survey years. But, we still needed to know how far every house is from the nearest artisanal mine. And for this, we use a database uh, that we got from the government of Burkina Faso showing about 2,300 informal mines in the country or mines. 
but it's so much larger than the one used by Brazilian Girard because it also shows informal mines. But the problem was I still didn't know when each of these mines opened. And so for this, we used satellite images. And we literally looked at thousands and thousands of images, um, as many as we could from each location, to see if we can determine when the mine opened. And this is a significant contribution because it allows us to move away from using the world gold price and to rather use something like the opening of a mine instead. And then lastly, we also differentiate between formal and informal mines. So we start with the same identification strategy used by Brazilian Girard, um, which is basically controlling for different things. What is the impact of living next to a potential artisanal mine in years with higher gold prices? But because with our refined analysis, we can go a step further and instead see also what's the impact of living next to an operating mine. So we find that the impact of the artisanal mine is mostly positive. Um, households, as, uh, expenditure and assets increased, um, both when we look at the gold price method and when we look at when a mine opened. Although we do find that the gold price method might slightly um, overestimate this impact. We also found that um, children were more likely to be enrolled in school um, this is a bit contrary to many qualitative studies saying that children leave school in order to mine, um, which just because school enrollment increases, it doesn't mean that children don't mine in their free time. It just means that on average, um, children are more likely to stay in school for longer. And we don't find that infant mortality improves around these mines, either when we compare a child born next to a mine to the rest of the country, or when we compare siblings born before and after the mine with each other. We do find actually that alcohol expenditure and tobacco expenditure increase dramatically um, and quite a lot more than, than the increase in total household expenditure. So the last question was, is it then better for a household to be next to a formal artisanal mine than next to an informal artisanal mine? And actually, we don't find that this is the case. So expenditure around formal mines are larger, but it's not significantly different to the expenditure effect around informal mines. We do actually find that there's more assets around informal mines and that temptation good expenditure is highest and school enrollment is lowest um, uh, when a household is, is next to both a formal and informal mine. So these findings are relevant because, first of all, in general, we need to understand the impact of these mines in order to design policies that can effectively address it. And more specifically, with regards to formalization, um, there has been many scholars and uh, organizations that have pushed for the formalization of artisanal mines. And the problem is just that in practice, this is really difficult um, because it's such a large not in kind of chaotic sector that local governments don't exactly know how to formalize um, artisanal mines in their countries. And so in Burkina Faso, they had a very lenient formalization policy where almost mines nearly have to register. Um, and so we can at least contribute to this policy debate that, that at least with regards to the impact of local communities, merely registering a mine does not have a significant effect. So then our last study in Burkina Faso, we look at the use of mercury and to understand why this is a problem, we have to look at how miners use mercury. Um, so first miners go down these very narrow shafts. Um, and they, they bring the ore up. Um, you see they have very little equipment. Then they grind it to very fine dust, like here. Um, then they add water to this. This allows them to pan the gold or like here run it over a sluice box or carpet. Um, and this basically increases the concentration of the gold in the ore. So then they add mercury to this, which is cheap and readily available on these mine sites. Um, and they really work it into the ore using their like bare hands. And so what happens is the mercury particles and the gold particles, it attaches to each other to form a gold amalgam, it's called, 
um, and this is basically just an alloy of gold and, 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 and mercury, which is easy to remove. They just wash away the excess dirt. And then they form a little bowl um, of the gold amalgam and they burn, they burn it to evaporate the mercury. And this method is so popular that artisanal miners are the largest human source of mercury pollution in the world. Um, and of course, mercury has quite significant health, um, adverse health impact for miners, especially the burning of the mercury vapor. But to totally eliminate mercury from the gold supply chain is really difficult, as I've also shown with co-authors in, in a separate project, um, where we found that, that mercury is basically cheap, it's um, available, it's often given out for free, it's easy to use, but it's also a way that these bosses on the mines kind of control and organize miners. So it's quite difficult to move away from mercury. But we say at least in the short term, while we are not at a mercury-free assistant mining sector, we should encourage miners to, to use the proper um, methods with personal protective equipment and to at least just protect themselves and have some health benefits for them personally. But we found that protection on these artisanal mines are very low, um, same as many other studies. And so we want to find out why this is the case. And so we have three potential reasons for this. First is that miners just don't know mercury is dangerous or they just don't know how to protect themselves. The second is that they don't believe they are personally at risk. And the last is that they don't have access to PPE or they can't afford it. And so the team here shown at the bottom, they visited four of the small mines shown by the black stars on the map. And we surveyed about uh, 200, th about 300 miners. And we asked them about mercury, um, equipment, the life on the mine. And just in general, we wanted to understand um, how they think and use mercury. So we did a field experiment then where we randomly gave out PPE. Then we um, took a few hair samples from miners that were willing to give us a sample. Um, and my colleagues at the ICP, um, Badmouth and Desiree, they analyzed the hair for us. Um, because the hair can be an indication of exposure to all forms of mercury in the last few weeks. Then we did two follow-up phone surveys and we also visited the mines again to give some feedback to the miners. So what we found was, first of all, that miners know mercury is dangerous. Um, they even think it's very dangerous to them personally compared to the average person. But if we look at the hair results, um, we found their risk perception is not quite accurate. So the people with high exposure to mercury weren't the ones who thought they were at risk of mercury exposure. And then um, we also did not find that thinking mercury is more dangerous led to higher PPE usage. Um, if we dig a bit deeper with the knowledge, we found that actually they know quite little about mercury in general. So they, for instance, um, don't know about the symptoms mercury of mercury poisoning or effective way to protect yourself. And those with higher knowledge were slightly more likely to say they use PPE. We did actually find that access has a significant impact on usage, but not merely having it for sale on the mine, because um, uh, probably they can't afford it, they had a very low willingness to pay for PPE. But when we gave it out for free in our field experiment, we found that it had a significant and large impact on, on, on usage. The limit of our study is that we relied on reported usage, so what miners said they used. And so this is obviously subject to various biases, um, but still we believe that giving out PPE for free could have a very significant impact on, on miners' health, uh, the health of miners, although it would probably not reduce mercury pollution in general. Um, uh, we do also recommend that this is combined with training and education. Uh, we, for example, created these flyers with kind of easy to follow ways to protect yourself and avoid exposure and miners really reacted well to it. But giving out gear is really expensive. So we recommend that it's a targeted approach 
um, giving it out uh, to people with the highest exposure first. And according to our hair analysis, we found that mercury traders or gold traders, also people who use it quite often, and they are most ex exposed to mercury, and um, probably because they, uh, the traders often burn the mercury again, or they're present when it's burned to oversee the process. Now I would like to move up the gold supply chain um, to see what we in, in high income countries could do to alleviate our impact upstream. I also had two smaller studies, one with the refiners um, and how they could potentially use blockchain to reduce the cost of sourcing from artists and miners. The other study was about the demand for certified gold from, from retailers' perspective. Um, I won't go into that now just because um, these weren't part of the main studies of my PhD. I'd like to go directly to um, the consumer side of the study we did in Switzerland. And so one of the major impacts we have from a high income country is our consumption and specifically the consumption of metals. So if we think of a mobile phone, a mobile phone contains many metals, um, tin, iron, tungsten, gold, silver. Um, and many of these metals are mined in very fragile areas. Um, and so we thought, what's the potential of, of collecting old phones um, in order to reintroduce these metals back into formal supply chain. Meaning what is the potential of basically opening an urban mine in Switzerland? Um, and so for our fourth study, we, we looked at the feasibility of doing this um, because we found most previous studies look at kind of the technical aspects of recycling. So how do you get the metals in the phone out of the phone? And not so much about getting the phone um, stored in someone's drawer into the recycling plant. And those studies you have often don't have like a clear um, indication of who's been treated, like who has been exposed by these initiatives to collect phones, or they don't have a proper control group. So it's very difficult to say what's the most effective way to collect phones. And so our study contributes to this in three ways. We first did a large survey in German-speaking Switzerland. Then we did a randomized controlled trial at the ETH in Zurich. And lastly, we did a cost-benefit analysis with the help from my colleagues at the ISTP. So with the survey, we found that indeed people reply to their phones quite quickly, especially younger and also more wealthy individuals. When it's replaced, only about 25% in Switzerland is recycled. The rest, the majority is just basically kept at home. And this adds up to quite a lot of phones. There's about 7 million unused phones in Switzerland, um, which includes a wide range of, of metals, including about 240 kilograms of gold, valued about 11 million US dollars. Um, and so the reason, if you want to understand how to get these phones back, we need to understand why people keep it. And it's not about data protection. A very few mentioned this. Um, we did not find that it's that the phones are still in use. The vast majority is not in use anymore. And it's not about valuing your old phone. Half of what spins it, they were willing to sell their phone for less than five dollars. So we believe the reason why people don't recycle is just effort. So you have a phone somewhere in a drawer, you have to go and get it, find out where to take it. Um, it's just it's it's a lot of effort, it's not urgent, and so we just never kind of do it. And this brings me to the second part of my project where we had a um, randomized controlled trial um, at the ETAs in Zurich, uh, where we used a mail back envelope method, which is basically an, a normal envelope um, with our address on it included and postage included. And we could distribute it to people. They could put their own old phone in there and mail it back to us for recycling. And um, so we distributed with the ETH Life magazine, um, which uh, was sent to about 10,000 German speaking employees and about 5,000 English speaking employees of the ETH in Zurich. But then we thought, is there some information we can add to this envelope, like a message that could motivate people to return their phone? So two of these messages were based on theories. The first was the social descriptive norm, which basically just says that people tend to do things if they think others are doing it. 
So we just told people, listen, the Swiss recycle quite a lot. Um, the next message was this idea that there's a very strong correlation between protecting the environment and recycling. Um, so we just told people to the right thing for nature, recycle your old phone. Then there was four envelopes with messages that we identified from the household survey. The last envelope didn't have any additional message, but it also didn't have um, uh, postage. So people could buy their own postage or they could drop it off at one of the campus info service desks at, on campus. So this one was just it's similar to the, the first um, envelope, our control group, but it's just more effort to, to, to recycle your phone. Um, so what happened is we accidentally turned the ETH into a recycling center. We received about 750 envelopes in the first month. Um, and we, uh, that's a bit, about a return rate of 5%, which is much higher than previous mailback envelope um, projects. And we believe it's because it's done within the ETH community, um, which has a high level of trust. We don't, we don't know for sure. So we, we would recommend that looking at what's the impact of trust on collection of or recycling um, could be an interesting topic for future research. So what we found was there's nothing really that we could say that increase um, the return rate. So none of the informational treatments for the entire group had any significant effect. Um, we found that including postage that have a very large and significant impact on the collection rate. We also found that just being German, <laughs> like receiving any German envelope also had a very significant impact on the return rate, except for one English envelope being told that the Swiss recycle a lot, that also had a very large impact on, on Swiss speaking, oh, sorry, English speaking people recycling their old phone. Um, the problem with this method is it's quite expensive. It can be up to $27 to collect one phone. Um, interestingly, adding postage, uh, although it's an added cost, it actually decreases the average collection cost because it increased the return rate by so much. But still, even with this higher return rate, we made a substantial um, loss because the market value of the metals in the phone is less than $2. Um, so yeah, I asked my colleague from the ICP, Livia, if she can calculate the environmental savings from our project to see if we include this, uh, these environmental savings, if that can make the project cost effective. And so we find that while the market value of metals and phone is about $1.6, if we include the environmental savings from recycling, it's actually 10 times more. Um, we also found that majority of the impact is from gold, even though there's only a very small amount of gold in the phone, and that the majority of the impact is in countries where the gold is mined, and other metals actually also is mined. Um, so taking this into consideration, we believe that this makes the project um, uh, cost effective. So these these findings are relevant in Switzerland because we believe it's very important to make recycling as easy as possible. As possible. Um, in Switzerland, there's already a prepaid recycling fee that's included into the cost of new devices, and that's used to recycle phones. Um, we believe extending this fee to something like postage, which would make recycling easy, would be cost effective, um, even when we consider the true value of the metals in the phone. So in my PhD, I look at the entire gold supply chain. Um, and of course, there's a lot we can do in the country of extraction, like making local markets more competitive, measuring the impact of these mines and also of licensing, um, helping miners with technical intervention, and also protective equipment. Um, but also as researchers, we cannot only rely on something like the world gold price to understand the sector. We need to look at a wider range of data, like hair samples, satellite images, field work, um, as well as methods to understand um, the artisanal mining sector. But then due to the interconnectedness of our world, we cannot only focus on the area or the place where the problem occurs. 
we need to look at solutions throughout the gold supply chain, also downstream, to see how we in higher income countries can change our behavior to address some of these um, issues upstream. I'd like to thank you all for your time, um, for listening to a summary of my doctoral thesis. Um, I'd like to especially thank my doctoral committee, especially my supervisor, um, Isabel Gunther, as well as my colleagues from the ICP and from NADL, who were always willing to talk about research and interesting findings and, and just in general um, uh, help and support. Then I'd like to thank my family um, and friends for all their um, love and support, as well as my children um, for inspiring me every day. <laughs>